Good morning and welcome to Divine Service on Reminiscere Sunday. Reminiscere from the intro at Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies, for they have ever been of old. That thought will uh, go through the entire service this morning. Our opening hymn is In Thee, Lord, Have I Put My Trust. We sing the first four verses of hymn 524. Christ, 
to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in this stead, and by the command of my Lord, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Who seest that of ourselves we have no strength, keep us both outwardly and inwardly, that we may be defended from, the, from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on Reminiscere Sunday is recorded for us in the prophecy given through St. Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 20 through 25. This is the word of the Lord. Let us sit attentively to receive it. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? And there is no other God beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. 
Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, Surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Here ends the lesson. We read responsively Psalm 130 as printed in the bulletin. Out of the depths, Lord, hear my voice. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, but there is forgiveness with you, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Holy Epistle appointed for this day is recorded for us in St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Finally then, brethren, we urge you and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Here ends the Holy Epistle. of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Lord, look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. The mighty acts of the Lord, who can show forth his praises. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he who doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor thou bearest unto thy people. Oh, visit me with thy salvation. Let us arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning in chapter 15 at the 21st verse. Jesus went out and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came 
and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent, except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Here ends the Holy Gospel.
dear fellow redeemed, by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, who in mercy came to walk among us and win salvation for us. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The words on which we meditate this morning are the words of the gospel lesson that you have just heard. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> We uh, pray in the propers today, if you will, that we not be put to shame. That's a word that in our day um, gets kind of a odd twist, I suppose, because of the way psychology uses the term. Shame, uh, according to psychology, is sort of like trotting out people's foibles and uh, and causing them embarrassment in front of other people as a way to kind of control people. It's not really the way the word is used in the scriptures. When we are praying to God that we not be put to shame, if we look at the way it's consistently used in the scriptures, it, it would be sort of translated, I suppose, in our day, uh, don't let me be disappointed, perhaps. It's the idea of looking to someone or to something for help, counting on someone and having them let us down, having them fail us. That would be being put to shame. I, I trusted in you, God, and you didn't come through for me. I was put to shame. That would be the idea. So we're, we're saying to God, God, I'm counting on you to be there for me. I'm counting on you to come through for me when I need you. Don't, don't let me be disappointed. Don't let me be put to shame. And by contrast, those who trust in the wrong thing or those who flippantly suggest there is no God, they will be put to shame. They will be disappointed. Even people in our day who have no fear of death because they have been so numbed to the reality of judgment. No concept that there literally is a hell and many people will suffer there for eternity. And because of that death, oh, you know, maybe that's the thing we want because you get out of the suffering of this world and then you know the proverb out of the frying pan and into the fire should come into play. Such people will be put to shame we pray that God in his mercy would continue to reach out to such people yet in our day. That they may know. That they may not fear in an empty, quavering sort of fear, but they may fear in this way. That they are drawn to the Savior, the one who can help. The God who declares himself to be merciful from ancient times. The one who prophesied what would take place and caused it to take place. That God, the only God, the one who truly does exist. Before we get into then this woman who came seeking mercy from that God, we should contemplate for a moment how it was that her daughter was demon possessed. Really, if we don't mess around with demonic things, we shouldn't get demon-possessed. And then again, so several things, I suppose, here. One is that when people talk about demon possession in the sense of the way Hollywood treats it, there's two different things that go on for people. And, and this is real, although the portrayal of it through Hollywood is a bit messed up, to be sure. But the idea of being cruelly demon-possessed means that you are attacked either inwardly or outwardly in a very profound way, okay? So that takes 
two different forms. One is, yes, literally controlled from the inside out and doing things that are harmful to you and the people around you. We have examples of that in the scriptures um, where people are literally demon possessed and they exhibit superhuman strength and uh, knowledge of things that they should not be able to know and things of that nature. That, that certainly occurs and that appears to be what this woman's daughter was suffering from. There's another type of what commonly gets lumped into demon possession and that's affliction by a demon where a demon sort of hovers around you and wants to uh, harm you or cause you trouble. Sometimes that's the will of God. For example, St. Paul, uh, he pointed out that because he was given a view into heaven itself, God wanting him to remain humble gave to him a demon to afflict him. That was sent by God, but it was a messenger of Satan, Paul said, who buffeted to him, whatever that means. It was a thorn in his flesh. Okay? But that was God's will. When Paul prayed that it be taken away, God said, no, my grace is enough for you. I suppose that's a bit disturbing to us to contemplate that, but yet, yet ultimately, that was a good thing for Paul. At other times, we pray that such a demon would be removed from us and God certainly removes that affliction to be sure. But there is a more common type of demon possession, one that each and every one of us in this room has experienced, whether we actually realize it or not. And much of the world that lives with that kind of demon possession outwardly looks very calm, very happy and everything seems to be going just fine with them and yet they're clearly demon possessed. You and I entered life demon possessed in this way. That we entered life in the kingdom of the devil. He was our master. And when we came to faith, when we were baptized, we were transferred from the kingdom of the devil to the kingdom of heaven. One of the ways of understanding the making of the sign of the cross upon oneself, which is clearly connected to baptism, where Christ comes and claims you as his own, is that when we cross ourselves, we remember that Christ came down from heaven to earth to take us from the kingdom of the devil under the law and condemnation on Christ's left hand and placed us, taking us from the goats, and placed us among his sheep on his right hand. That is one of the ways to understand that. Not, not a bad way to think of that, that when we come before God and pray, it is because Christ has come down from heaven to earth, taken us from among the goats, and placed us among his sheep. So, parents, Christian parents, are very much like this woman. When they bring their children to the waters of baptism, pleading that God in his mercy would deliver their children out of the kingdom of the devil and place them into the kingdom of heaven because they come into life demon-possessed in the kingdom of the devil and we pray that God in his mercy would take them out of that kingdom and in his mercy place them in the kingdom of heaven. So why was this woman's daughter demon possessed? We don't know. Doesn't hurt to speculate a little bit not in the sense of trying to answer it, but just to contemplate, you know, what could have gone on? Did she fail in her parenting? Did her own daughter rebel against her as the representative of God for her good in being her parent? Did she really rebel against her and thus was rebelling against God and placed herself in harm's way? We don't know. 
Did she play around with the occult arts like somebody today would play around with Ouija boards and seances and things like that? We don't know. We don't know. But we should take a moment to contemplate that and remember we need to be careful of these things. Because when we go and play near the devil, that dog that is on a chain, when we get close to him, you know, it's kind of like all bets are off. We, we now place ourselves close enough to be harmed by him. And we do well not to ask, how much can I play around with? But how far away do I need to stay to be safe? That is always the better question, isn't it? So this woman, a foreigner, a woman of Canaan, a Syrophoenician in, you know, the other account, the other translation, uh, she comes to Jesus, one who is looked down on by the Jews, an outsider, at best a half-breed, somebody whose theology at its best points was messed up. Yeah, but she's the one that comes to Jesus. And look at her words, words of faith, right in the first plea. Lord, son of David, the title for the promised Messiah. She comes to Jesus, understanding him to be the one who is promised, the one who would take away the sin of the world, that one who would be ruler of Israel, that king sent by God who would rule forever. She comes to him. And, and think about that. What emperor has time for the plea of one individual person, let alone somebody who's kind of an outsider at the best? Seriously. But her faith is such that she believes he will hear her Lord, have mercy on me. Be the atoner for me and my sin and my worthlessness. You, who are the promised son of David, have mercy on me. And here's why. And she brings a plea on behalf of another person, a plea on behalf of somebody who she cares for, a plea on behalf of her daughter. She, who is truly a daughter of God, comes to God and says, you have mercy on me because I want to have mercy on my daughter. You, O oh Lord, do this for her as doing it for me, isn't that what you and I do when we bring our children to the waters of baptism? Lord, I am your son, I am your daughter, I am your child. This is my child. Take my child, make my child your child. Have mercy on my child as having mercy to me, your child. It's really a remarkable faith. And it's not about how strongly she believes, but it's about what she believes. And as she calls upon God, even like in our colleagues or in the Lord's Prayer, she proclaims God to be the one, the one who can help, the one who is merciful from ancient times, the one who can help. And Jesus ignored her. He ignored her. And obviously she persisted. Lord, son of David. Hello, I know who you are. You're the one who's supposed to help me. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me already. Help my daughter who's severely demon possessed, please. And the apostles become Embarrassed, don't they? Lord, send her away. She is crying out after you. And please don't misunderstand these words, send her away. It's not, oh, get rid of her. But the sending away, when you follow it through the scriptures, the sending is with a blessing. You send someone away 
blessing them on their way. So you are sent away at the end of the service with the benediction, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, etc. That's the sending away. So the apostles are coming to Jesus and saying, help her. Give her what she's asking. This is getting a little embarrassing. She's asking for your help. She's crying out after you. Why are you not helping her? Excuse me. Jesus says to his disciples, not to her. Excuse me. My call is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm sent to them. They're the chosen ones. They're the ones into whom I am born. That's who I'm sent to. Everybody else will get taken care of in time. Let me be about my business. And of course, we know there is purpose in these words, isn't there? Because the woman came and worshipped him. What did that look like when she worshipped him? tells you in the text, right? The woman came to him and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She worshipped him, not by giving him anything. She worshipped him by begging him, Lord, help me. Worship first and foremost is this, that we look to God for our help. That's the worship of God. That we stand before him as beggars. God, I need your help. That is what glorifies God. That is what honors Christ as God, Lord of lords, God of gods. Lord, help me. And Jesus called her a dog. I wouldn't be right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs, now would it? And she doesn't miss, miss a beat. We don't know if she doesn't miss a beat because like faithful parents, she is so concerned about her daughter that nothing is going to get in the way of that. Or if she just knows and her faith is truly that confident, it's really not the point. She doesn't miss a beat because of who Jesus is. You call me a dog. Yes, I am. I am sitting here begging my master, the one who owns me. I am a dog. I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. And I flee for refuge to my master, the one who bought me with his blood, or in the case of the woman, who came to purchase me with his blood. Master, I am a dog, but I am your dog, Lord Jesus. Fine. And even the dogs feed off of the crumbs that fall from the master's table. It's all I want. I belong to you, O Lord. You are my master. You own me. And because you own me, you will provide. You will be merciful to me. No wonder she hears those beautiful words. Great is your faith. Not because she has such a strong feeling of believing and trusting, but because what she trusts in is so strong and so faithful to his promises, and so loving, and so much the possessor of all things. Let it be to you as you desire. When our faith is such that we desire godly things, and we beg God in prayer for those things, whether for ourselves or on behalf of others, we receive what we ask for. 
in the epistle lesson, we are urged to feed what we want to grow, to starve what we want to die. We are urged to feed that resurrected being that we are, the new person in Christ, to seek to do that which is pleasing in his sight and to separate ourselves from that which is of the devil. Bring your prayers before God. Lord, help me. Protect me, guard me from all attacks to the body and from all evil thoughts within that would harm my soul. When we desire godly things, when we desire forgiveness, when we desire that we may be kinder to the people around us, loving others as Christ has loved us, well, then Jesus, the son of David, the promised one says, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. Amen. Please arise. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, 
We give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part, thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee, especially that thou hast preserved unto us in their purity, thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant, thy, grant unto thy holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. And may we, in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians, fight the good fight of faith, and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth. Especially do we entreat thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us, and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling, and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day, before the night cometh when no man can work. And when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power and receive us into thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee on the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. <clears throat> The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, who on the tree of the cross didst give salvation unto mankind that whence death arose, thence life also might rise again, and that he who by a tree once overcame might likewise by a tree be overcome through Christ our Lord, through whom with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of heaven and earth are full. Oh, Hosanna, 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 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, The same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Lord Christ, the Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world,
made Christ's true body and his precious blood, and strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting.
Love us a lot. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to light and the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to thee, almighty God, that thou hast refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we beseech thee that of thy mercy thou would strengthen us through the same, in faith towards thee and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with the end of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you.
Please be seated. 